Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Wayne, and I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, which is jointly based at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. On behalf of our leadership team and the planning committee for this event, which includes Darshan Mehta, Gloria Ye, Ashwini Nadkarni, Atra Nusrat, Emma Owings, and David uh, Donald Le Levy, I welcome you to our 2022 Integrative Medicine Network Forum. Structured as a center without walls, the mission of our OSHA Center is to advance leading edge research, education, and clinical care to promote an integrative model of health, healing, and well being. Our model emphasizes care for the whole person, body, and mind, and appreciates that the health of individuals is integrally related to the health of our social communities and the environment. One key pathway through which we implement our mission is our network forums, which take place every two years. Our forums bring together clinicians, researchers, educators, and the public to explore critical health issues, public health issues that we believe can be informed by an integrative health perspective. The theme of this year's forum is the lived experience of depression, an integrative approach. And our planning committee chose this theme for a few reasons, and I'm gonna share some slides to help illustrate my opening remarks. So first, as we all appreciate, depression is one of the most prevalent and debilitating mental health conditions with global estimates in 2019 of approximately 5%, that's one out of every 20 people. In much of the world, including the United States, Prevalence in adolescents and young adults is significantly higher, being on average 17% and as high as 30% for adolescents that report themselves as multiracial. And not surprisingly, the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly exacerbated the magnitude of mental health problems, with recent estimates of depressive disorders in many parts of the world, including the US, increasing by 30%, leading to more than 50 million new cases worldwide. But concerns about depression go far beyond statistics. My guess is that just about everyone listening today knows firsthand from personal experience or from interactions with family members, friends, or patients that the suffering caused by depression is complex and impacts many aspects of the health of individuals and those around them. Depression impacts not only mood, but can negatively impact core behaviors, including sleep, physical activity, diet, family dynamics, social engagement, work, and education. Depression is a key factor for substance abuse and at its worst can lead to suicide. Not surprisingly, depression is a leading cause of disability worldwide and a major contributor to the overall global burden of disease. But the complex, because of the complex mind-body cross-system manifestations of depression, we believe that bringing integrative whole person perspective to better understanding its causes, prevention, and treatments makes a great deal of sense. Yet despite its prevalence and burden, too many people suffering from depression do not get adequate care. A recent study including data from 84 countries reported that access to minimally adequate treatment ranged from only 23% in high-income countries to 3% in low and low moderate in income countries. Another report estimated that more than half of adults with mental illness in the US do not receive treatment and in a number that has not declined since 2011. Of concern, over 60% of youth with major depression do not receive any mental health treatment. And as with healthcare in general globally and in the US, there are deeply disturbing and growing disparities in the care that many marginalized and underrepresented populations have access to. It's likely that these treatment gaps are due to many interacting factors, including the stigma of depression, high costs for treatment paired with limited insurance co coverage, and a shortage of providers. Exploring how the broader community of healthcare providers included allied and complementary and integrative healthcare providers, such as acupuncturists, mind-body therapists, nutritionists, along with conventional providers, nurses, psychologists, social workers, community workers, and others can contribute to the treatment and prevention of depression could significantly reduce treatment gaps. 
Another barrier to progress in understanding and treating depression results from the siloed nature of healthcare and few opportunities and incentives for communication and collaboration across disciplines. Using the metaphor of blindfolded, blindfolded people touching an elephant, each has experiences that are limited to the parts that they feel with lack of appreciation of the whole organism they are blind to. In the case of depression, there are neuroscientists who primarily view depression as a dysfunction of the brain's neural network, whereas psychopharmacologists may be more inclined to see the problem as a chemical imbalance. Some psychologists may emphasize relationships among family members or broader social support issues, whereas clerics and other spiritual leaders may see depression as an existential matter or the dark night of the soul. And finally, across the many complementary and integrative health disciplines, depression may be viewed and treated as a mind-body disconnection, a nutritional problem, or an imbalance in chi or the doshas. Each of these perspectives is valuable, but a shared understanding of the whole might be transformative. As a center, as a center without walls, a key element of the OSHA mission is to bring people together to address complex issues like depression from an inter- or transdisciplinary way. Accordingly, the main goal of our forum today is to create a greater understanding of depression through cross-disciplinary dialogue that's rooted in scientific inquiry, multicultural perspectives, and clinical innovation. Questions we're gonna to explore today are, are we dealing with a problem in neuroscience or a disorder of mind and spirit? How do we distinguish between curing and healing and also strive to address both? We'll discuss cultural themes in defining and managing depression and look at leading edge approaches to treating depression. A key goal of the event is to shape the global dialogue all healthcare providers, allopathic, allied, and integrative, will need to have in order to meet the growing global burden of disease. So I now have the privilege of queuing up some additional welcoming remarks from my colleague and friend, Dr. Maurizio Fava. Dr. Fava is a renowned world leader in the field of depression, a statement that is substantiated by his more than 800 original research articles and eight edited books. Among his many titles and roles, Dr. Fava is psychiatrist in chief in the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital and the Slatter Family Professor of, Psych of Psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. Due to prior engagements, he could not join us live today, but generously offered to pre-record the following welcome remarks, which I'm going to share with you now. Hi, I'm Maurizio Fava, and I'm the Chief of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. And I'm personally very excited that this year's two-day virtual uh, Integrative Medicine Network Forum of the OSHA Center for Integrative Medicine is focused on creating a greater and better understanding of depression. I have been treating depressed patients and conducting research in depression for over 30 years here at Mass General. I have to say that it is very apparent to any clinician that depression is a condition that does require a comprehensive and integrative approach to optimize the outcome. Depression represents a very significant public health issue. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a tripling of the rates of depression in the general population, particularly among the younger cohorts. Therefore, the prevalence of depression is currently so high that it, it, it affects more than one in 10 people at any given time. In addition, depression is highly disabled. It often has a chronic and recurrent course, and it is known to cause a high economic burden for society related to both direct and indirect costs. Depression commonly observed in primary care patients may also influence significantly the outcome of comorbid medical illnesses, such as heart disease or diabetes or cancer. And yet in primary care, under recognition and under treatment of depression is common, despite the relatively high prevalence. So it's important that we recognize depression and we treat it. 
to make sure that our patients get better. From a clinical standpoint, depression is a condition that includes abnormalities of affect and mood, neurovegetative functions such as appetite and sleep disturbances, cognition, such as inappropriate guilt, reduced concentration of memory and feelings of worthlessness. Physical symptoms like, you know, pain and psychomotor activity, such as agitation or retardation. There is a great deal of heterogeneity in depression. Some patients may not be able to get out of bed, are unable to feel any pleasure, they suffer from insomnia and from lack of appetite, thereby losing weight and, and losing sleep, whereas others are able to function. They can temporarily feel better if good things happen to them, you know, what we call mood reactivity. They may overeat and oversleep and, and therefore look the complete opposite of the more melancholic patients that I described. In some individuals, depression may arise out of the blue, whereas in others, there may be one or more stressful life event that can be identified as a trigger or precipitant. The tremendous increase in the rates of depression with the COVID-19 pandemic is thought to be related to the allostatic load and the stress related to the current situation in our country. This is also a reminder that an oversimplistic view of depression may not be helpful, particularly in those patients whose onset of depression seems to be stress-related and multifactorial. Assuming that we're only dealing with a problem in brain chemistry and neuroscience, does not take into consideration our complexity as human beings. An integrated medicine approach to depression is therefore quiet. I'm Maurizio Fava, and I'm the chief of psychiatry, whereas in others, precipitant. The tremendous pandemic is thought to be related to the allostatic load. This is also a reminder that an oversimplistic view of depression may not be helpful, particularly in those patients whose onset of depression seems to be stress-related and multifactorial. Assuming that we're only dealing with a problem in brain chemistry and neuroscience does not take into consideration our complexity as human beings. An integrative medicine approach to depression is therefore critical to optimize the outcome the treatment of depression. And I'm therefore delighted to see that this Integrated Medicine Network Forum is in fact focused on illuminating the critical role of integrated medicine in the treatment of depression. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Favre, for those welcoming remarks. And thanks everyone for their patience with that slight technical glitch. I was a little worried there for a second, but I think we recovered nicely. So in a few moments, I'll tell you a little bit more about our speakers and the agenda we have for our remarkable two days. But before that, I wanted to let you know a little bit more about who you are as a community of attendees. As of this morning, we had 791 registrants, and I believe that's inching up um, by the moment, of which about um, we have representation from 40 different countries. About half of the attendees um, um, who are attending today are clinical providers, about 28% researchers, and another 28% are involved in education. I hope you take advantage of the various uh, functions on our platform to uh, virtually network with each other and to communicate in, in lots of different ways. And I'll say a few things about that in a few moments. I also want to take some time here to uh, acknowledge and, and really thank all of our sponsors including the Bernard Osher Foundation, the Weil Foundation, the Ubroy Foundation for Religious Studies, and locally, the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine and the Departments of Psychiatry at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Mass General Hospital. 
So we've assembled a really truly remarkable and diverse group of presenters for this event. To give you an overview, and if all goes as plans, this is how we've imagined the next two days unfolding. Our first keynote this morning will be delivered by Dr. Vikram Patel, who will share his insights into the global lived experience of depression. Then Dr. Ashwini Narkarni will emcee a panel of multiple leading psychiatrists and psychiatry researchers who are going to provide short synopses of what we have and have not learned um, from viewing depression from a variety of scientific approaches. The final session of this morning will be emceed by Dr. Don Levy, who will shift this discussion from the science of curing to the art of healing and facilitate a discussion with patients who've experienced depression firsthand. After a lunch break, Dr. Jacobson will host a panel, including experts who will compare and contrast how depression is understood and treated from three alternative healing traditions, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, and Tibetan medicine. The final panel of the day will be led by Dr. Gloria Ye and will explore a variety of complementary and integrative health approaches, including ones based on diet and supplements, emerging behavioral therapies, and mindful movement. For local participants that registered for the in-person reception, we're going to convene at 5.30 at Gordon Hall on the Harvard Medical School campus. After hopefully a good night's sleep, day two is going to begin with our second keynote uh, delivered by Dr. Greg Friccione on integrated medicine at the crossroads of medicine and public health. This is going to be followed by Dr. Darshan Mehta emceeing a panel that will include discussions of ongoing public health and cross-cultural initiatives centered on depression treatment and, de and uh, prevention. And he's also going to lead what promises to be an incredibly rich panel discussion on what faith communities can teach us and includes clerics and scholars representing a variety of religious and spiritual traditions. Following lunch, there's going to be two final sessions. The first emceed by Dr. Narkani will explore leading edge complementary and integrative health therapies for depression, including psychedelics, infrared light therapy, interventional psychiatry, um, and hyperthermia. The second and final session, led by Akhra Nusrat, will focus on the importance of connecting to social and natural ecosystems, and will include discussions with leading experts on social connection, storytelling, and natural therapies, uh, nature therapies. Promise it to be a really exciting panel. We're going to end the day with presentations of best poster awards and some closing remarks by Dr. Ye. But before getting going, um, uh, just a few practical housekeeping matters. If you'd like to submit a question during any of our presentations, please use the Ask a Question tab uh, next to the Zoom window that you're watching uh, the conference on right now. Our MCs for each session will be curing, curating questions and passing them on to the speakers. If you're interested in receiving continuing medical, ed medical education credits for each session that you join, your attendance will be recorded by our virtual platform. After the conference, you'll be sent a survey by our CME provider to claim your CME credits. Uh, please see the frequently asked questions feature for more details on this. So there's a number of ways to connect with other attendees um, uh, during and even after the conference. You can find more details about this in the FAQ section, including creating or joining conversations, participating in our facilitated networking groups, messaging each other, setting up private meetings, and using the chat box during presentations. Lastly, if you have any trouble navigating the event, please go to the Frequently Asked Question tab in our main menu or get support from our conference support technician by going to Need Help in the top left corner of your screen or through your drop-down box under your profile icon. By clicking on either of these, you'll be able to use the chat function with the technical uh, that provides technical support. So now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our first keynote, Dr. Vikram Patel. Dr. Patel is the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health in the Blavatnik Institute's Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He co-leads the department's Mental Health for All Lab and co-leads the Global Mental Health at Harvard Initiative. His work is focused on the burden of mental health 
problems across the life course, their association with social disadvantage, and the use of community resources for their prevention and their treatment. He's the co-founder of multiple international programs, including Movement for Global Mental Health, the Center for Global Mental Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and Sangath, an Indian uh, non-governmental organization, which won the World Health Organization's Public Health Champion of India Prize. Mm -hmm. Among many, many other prestigious acknowledgements for his lifetime of work, he is an appointed fellow of the UK's Academy of Medical Sciences, He's been awarded the Chalmers Medal by the Royal Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, the Sarnoff Prize for the National, uh, by the National Academy of Medicine, and the Pardes Humani Humanitarian Prize by the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. I cannot think of a better person to start off our conversation today. So please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Patel. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Wayne, and thank you to the uh, Medicine in Integrative Medicine Forum for giving me the honor of uh, uh, speaking at this uh, very exciting event on a subject that I have spent the better part of my career uh, focused on, the understanding of depression and the caring for people who live with depression in diverse global contexts. Um, I'm going to be actually spending most of my uh, presentation really talking about uh, the work that I jointly led with Professor Helen Herman um, uh, on the Lancet Commission, the Lancet World Psychiatric Association Commission on Depression that was launched earlier this year in April of this year. Um, and this entire commission report is freely uh, accessible from the Lancet website. Just want to acknowledge uh, that the commission was led by an incredible cast of uh, leaders in the work in the field of depression from around the world and spanning pretty much all the different disciplines um, that uh, Professor Fava showed us in that wonderful slide of the elephant, all the different perspectives um, that often uh, uh, cast a light on understanding depression. And you can see all my colleagues here on this slide. The goal of the Lancet Commission on Depression was threefold. Firstly, to advance our understanding on the nature and causes of depression. Secondly, to synthesize the evidence on prevention and care and to better uh, identify knowledge gaps that could benefit from future research. But perhaps most importantly, to synthesize the evidence so that we could recommend actions based on the knowledge we already have to promote public understanding, prevention, and care for people with depression globally. So the first important message, and this is an important one, something perhaps that many in the audience will think is a intuitive one, but it's important to emphasize that depression has been recognized as a human condition across cultures and for millennia. And why is this important to state? This is because for quite a long while in recent years, there has been the notion that depression is an invention or a creation of psychiatry, or that it is particularly an affliction that affects Western or high income societies. We were able to document that conditions very similar to what we might call depression today, based on the phenotype of the condition, have, have been described in scriptures going back to the most ancient civilizations of South Asia, China, and so on. This is important because it reflects the fact that this condition is as old as humankind and that the current conceptualization of depression is simply the most modern biomedical view of this particular condition. This current biomedical view has been the basis of countless epidemiological studies that have documented the existence the prevalence and the impact of depression in diverse populations around the world. This large body of evidence has been synthesized by the global burden of disease that we've heard referred to earlier by Professor Fava, that has documented the high burden accounted for by depression in all societies of the world. Professor Wayne mentioned also how this burden has been greatly amplified by the COVID pandemic. But a very important point that this particular slide displays is when depression strikes people across the life course. And what is clearly apparent 
is that the burden of depression rises very sharply during the second and third decades of life. Therefore, unlike most other non-communicable health conditions, depression is a condition of young people and young adults. This is important because given the fact that depression can oftentimes run a chronic relapsing course, if the condition strikes you in the prime of your youth, this is likely to impair the trajectory of, the, of your life that follows. The evidence that we synthesize also compellingly demonstrates the close association between depression and social adversities in a bi-directional way. Adversities, particularly those faced early in the life course, such as adversities in early childhood, right the way through into your early 20s, are strong risk factors for the development of depression. But similarly, and conversely, when you live with depression, you're more likely to face social adversities, for example, because depression interferes with your ability to complete education or to be productive in the workplace. And of course, contrary to what many people think that depression is simply a disabling condition and therefore should not be prioritized, particularly in societies where there is high, uh, where there's a high burden of conditions associated with mortality. In fact, the commission clearly demonstrates the rich literature that depression is associated with premature mortality through a number of different pathways, not only suicide, but also, for example, through increasing the risk of mortality when depression coexists with cardiovascular disease. This particular quote from John Steinbeck reflects, of course, this in effect of depression that has permeated into popular literature. But perhaps the most disturbing evidence that the commission synthesizes is that there has been virtually no change or inflection point in the global burden of depression over the last three decades. On this slide, you can see the flat line that the eight standardized DALIs accounted for by depression have remained absolutely flat for the last 30 years. During the same period of time, however, the burden of virtually every other non-communicable condition, and of course this ex excludes all mental health conditions, has shown a steady decline. And this must be a matter of great concern because over these last 30 years, researchers and funders around the world have spent tens of billions of dollars. The NIMH alone has spent more than $20 billion in trying to understand the nature of mental health conditions of which depression is one of the most important and trying to uncover new therapeutics and preventative interventions. It's very clear from this particular slide that this large investment does not seem to have produced the desirable impacts on the population burden of this condition. And so the real burning question that the commission tries to address is why have we spectacularly failed in shifting the needle on the global burden of suffering due to this condition. And we conclude that this is because of the very narrow biomedical framing of depression. And we heard Professor Pava speak to this point a little earlier. The narrow biomedical framing of depression as a diagnostic category, which then leads to, to a cookie cutter approach on the management of depression. This has failed to recognize the profound heterogeneity of the lived experience of depression. The unique personal histories from the most earliest days of our lives, which determine the risk, course, and outcome of the illness. And very importantly, the power of diverse interventions, particularly low intensity community delivered psychosocial interventions that can help prevent and promote recovery from depression. Depression is a profoundly heterogeneous condition. It is incredible to state that it is possible for two individuals to meet the same diagnostic criteria of depression as defined by the DSM or ICD, and yet not to share a single symptom in common. 
It is even more concerning that amongst the diverse lived experiences of depression in the global context, some of the most common features of the condition are in fact not part of the diagnostic criteria. On this slide, you can see uh, the prevalence of symptoms of depression in global samples. And here we've divided these samples according to populations in high and low and middle income countries, of course, these are themselves hugely heterogeneous. Nevertheless, what you can see here are the symptoms ordered according to their frequency. And those that are accompanied by an asterisk are those that are in the diagnostic criteria. So as you run your eyes down that list on the y-axis, you will notice the number of symptoms that are very common, but which are not in the diagnostic criteria. And some, such as thinking too much, a symptom that's been defined uh, and described in multiple Asian and African cultures, um, is reported by as many as a third or more of people with depression. The way forwards then, is to personalize depression interventions, taking into account the heterogeneity of the clinical phenotype, the unique diversity of personal stories, and what people with a lived experience of depression want. And so what might that look like? Firstly, we must move away from the cookie cutter approach that considers depression as a diagnostic category in which people with the same diagnosis will receive the same care. A one-size approach does not fit all. And the foundation of personalizing care is to begin the care process through a formulation that addresses all these personal characteristics that you can see on the slide. This then leads us to a staged approach to care that recognizes that people with depression may be placed on a dimension of staging that you see on the slide, and that at each stage of the evolution of the illness, a different set of interventions might be best suited for that particular stage. What is very clear is that evidence-based interventions are available across each of these different stages. And at the heart of these evidence-based interventions are psychosocial interventions interventions that target the psychological and social mechanisms that both explain the emergence of depression, but equally importantly, the, the maintenance and perpetuation of this condition across the life course. Now, psychosocial interventions are rich in their evidence base. Indeed, a recent network meta-analysis comparing psychosocial interventions with medication demonstrated compellingly that Psychosocial interventions were superior to medication, in particular when one considered long-term recovery outcomes. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, how well are we able to deliver these interventions at the population level? Let us look at the US as an exemplar, a country that spends more on depression care that has more mental health professionals per capita than any other country in the world. Yet it turns out that not only do only about 50% of people with a depressive episode seek care from the formal medical sector, but amongst those who do, the overwhelming majority will leave a care encounter with a prescription and only a quarter will actually receive evidence-based psychological treatments. This is in spite of the fact that not only are these treatments superior in long-term outcomes, but patients, especially those from low-income and minority groups, overwhelmingly express preference, but are even less likely to receive these interventions. And those of us who work in clinical care will immediately know when people receive the treatment they want, they report higher satisfaction, higher completion rates, and do better. The global health challenge is even more grave. There's virtually 0% coverage of evidence-based psychosocial intervention in most of the world's population. And a key reason for this barrier is both supply side barriers, the narrowly defined notion of who can be a depression care provider in diverse global contexts, but also a demand side barrier. The demand side barrier that many people with depression do not adopt 
a biomedical framing of their lived experience and therefore do not see the value of consulting a mental health professional, even if a mental health professional was actually available. And of course, that partly explains the large unmet needs for mental health care in the US. The commission is very excited about the evidence that has emerged from diverse global contexts that have demonstrated how community resources such as community health workers, peer support workers, nurses, and lay counselors can be deployed to deliver low intensity psychosocial interventions with tremendous outcomes on, on, on recovery rates. One example is a six session behavioral activation treatment that we designed with our partners in India for delivery by lay counselors for people in primary care. We demonstrated that this intervention improved upon usual care by increasing remission rates in people with severe depression so that two thirds of people recovered at three months after a six session treatment. And five years later, two thirds stayed well. What this shows you is that not only is this brief lay counselor delivered intervention, a good intervention for two thirds of people living with severe depression, but I think the converse is also important. One third do need more specialized care. We are now digitizing the curriculum for this intervention so that large numbers of frontline workers can learn how to deliver this intervention not only through online learning, but also through remote supervision and quality assurance. And as I speak, the first batch of India's community health workers have begun to deliver this brief intervention just last week. I learned that more than 1,000 ushers have already delivered care to more than 7,000 patients with depression in rural communities in central India in just the last two months. And excitingly, we are now adopting and embracing this very approach back home here in the US. Last year, thanks to winning the Lone Star Depression Challenge, we are now scaling up community health worker delivered brief psychosocial interventions for depression on the Empower platform that I launched at Harvard Medical School in partnership with the American Psychological Association and the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute in, in Texas. A key point to emphasize here is that what we're doing is building the foundations of a care delivery system in the community to address both demand and supply side barriers, but that this foundation must be seen as an extension of the footprint of the existing mental health care system reaching the last mile and in doing so addressing historic disparities in access to good quality care, but it cannot be seen as a separate delivery system. And of course, the collaborative delivery models that we are using both in India and the US is the best delivery model, the most evidence-based delivery model that allows us to ensure that people receive the care that they need across the continuum of care. In conclusion, what the commission really calls for, and I think this is exactly aligned with the integrative uh, a, a perspective that this particular forum is advocating is a whole of society engagement to translate the rich evidence that we have on the effectiveness of a range of different preventative and care interventions for people with depression across the entire staging dimension of this condition. The commission has a set of recommend re recommendations for the general community for healthcare practitioners, in particular primary care practitioners, for researchers and for decision makers. And we close with a message of hope. If these recommendations were embraced, we could invest in depression prevention and care with the knowledge we already have, and that this would represent excellent value for money by contributing not only to improving the outcomes of people who live with this condition, but to the attainment of several fundamental sustainable development goals, demonstrating that not only is there no health without mental health, but that there is no sustainable development without mental health. Thank you very much. Dr. Patel, that was a fabulous presentation, really inspiring, really thought-provoking. 
And I'm hoping that the audience continues to send in some questions um, to, to continue this discussion. Um, I have one for you to get things going. Um, given your global perspectives of things and, and a lot of your work in India, um, you mentioned the potential for traditional systems to contribute uh, beyond our conventional diagnosis of and treatment of, of depression. I'm curious what your experience is um, on the grassroots level for traditional systems like Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine, um, both in the effectiveness, but also in scaling up to social programs in, in, um, in various cultures. Well, you know, thanks, Peter. This is such an important question. In both the cultures that you've, uh, uh, societies that you've mentioned, India and China, in both countries, the state actively embraces and promotes uh, traditional systems of medicine. Uh, Ayurveda isn't the only system in India. There are other systems as well. Uh, and of course, yoga is not a system of medicine, but uh, but 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 a, but a practice that cuts across systems of medicine. You will find that in the government of India, there is an entire ministry devoted to the scaling up of uh, uh, traditional systems of medicine and similarly in China. And both these systems of medicine actually embrace a strong evidence-based perspective as well. So for example, you will find a large body of randomized controlled trials on the use of traditional Chinese systems of medicine for the care of a variety of health conditions, including depression. And suffice to say, in both of these systems of medicine, the key therapeutic ingredient is in fact the therapeutic alliance, which I believe is equally true for many of the more biomedical uh, 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 evidence-based interventions. Certainly in the psychosocial space, Peter, the therapeutic alliance, the non-specific ingredients of being a supportive listening uh, uh, provider are actually equally true in other systems of medicine as well. So I'm a great believer that these other systems offer a, a, a very viable route to scaling up care. These are also systems of medicine that, of course, have much fewer demand side barriers because they're deeply embedded uh, in the culture and context of those particular societies. Thank you for those comments. And uh, just to alert the audience, tomorrow we'll have some discussions um, from representatives of Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, and Tibetan medicine to um, specifically around this and the evidence base and the cultural um, context of those work. And as you know, um, the work of Ted Kepchuk here at, at the Harvard Medical School and the Osher Center initially um, really focus on the therapeutic alliance. And, and I believe um, th those are such critical components. Um, and so another question as I'm waiting for, for some other comments to come in, um, you looked at the demographic, uh, in your slide on the demographics, uh, some of these problems of depression happen so early in life. I'm wondering if, there are particular initiatives that we can get right at the start in terms of prevention instead of treating these things um, in adolescence and in early adulthood. And then as they become codified as complex problems in later life, how do we prevent depression? What are some initiatives in the community? Um, and obviously it's a complex question because it involves so many of the issues on your last slide of politics and, and economies and, and inequities. But I'm wondering if you can begin to comment on that. So Peter, I think the most um, you know, stark observation that the commission made was that most depressive episodes or the, or the most people with depression have an onset that begins before the age of 30, even earlier before the age of 24 for a significant proportion of people. Yet most services for people with mental health problems focus on adults, not on adolescents and young people. Uh, and of course, the demand side barriers are also much greater in young people who are famously, uh, you know, feel invincible. I mean, this is true, you know, for uh, across all health conditions. Um, and so we have to really focus on early intervention and prevention. And, you know, for a long time, we've thought that this is about we don't, really, we don't really have any good targets for prevention, but actually we do, Peter. The commission clearly demonstrates the rich evidence on the impact of harmful environments in the early years of life from birth right up into the early 20s. And those environments will change uh, across the life course, in the earliest years, those are home environments. In the school years, those are school and, 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 and educational institution environments. And in early adulthood, uh, it's the workplace environment. And I believe that we do have clearly defined interventions for each of those environments with the goal of promoting nurturing environments, environments that do not create toxic stress. Um, and in fact, what's really exciting about this evidence too 
is that these interventions can be delivered by multiple different kinds of, uh, of actors in very diverse sectors. For example, parenting interventions that are delivered by, uh, by community health workers or indeed by other parents or workplace interventions that can be delivered by people with a lived experience of depression. And that just speaks so, so directly to the sort of need for transdisciplinary discussions across dialogues that go beyond just people who work with mental health into the whole biopsychosocial environment. Um, so uh, that's such an important point. Uh, along the lines of including um, people to, to contribute to this um, um, in different parts of society, one of the questions is how in some of the work you describe, but maybe in other contexts as well, are lay workers trained in this new global vision of depression? Um, and who's responsible for this training? So, Peter, this is a this is the next big uh, uh, you know uh, implementation challenge that I am embracing. So, I think the question of whether lay health workers, uh, peer support workers, other non specialist providers can effectively treat depression is no longer a question that has any equipoise attached to it. Uh, more than one hundred trials. You know, this is one of the largest bodies of implementation science that exists in the field of mental health. Uh, the question now is how do you scale up? And the AMPA initiative that we've launched at Harvard Medical School, uh, as well as in India, is really using digital tools to support the rapid scaling up of the workforce by digitizing curricula and delivering them alongside a range of other digital uh, 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 tools such as competency assessments and quality assurance because I think we all know that caring for people with depression requires a lifelong process of being supported, being supervised and quality assurance. So Empower's first footprint in the US is in Texas as I mentioned thanks to the Lone Star Depression Challenge but we now also have similar work beginning for schools and educational institutions mm -hmm. to address early interventions for adolescents with mood and anxiety problems. Um, and I'm, I encourage those uh, in, in, in the community who are connected today uh, who would like to learn more about Empower simply to write to me. We have a lot of publications and, and, and materials that will illustrate what we're doing, the methods we use, but there is a systematic process. And I wanna end by simply saying one thing. If there is one big question, uh, one big challenge, why known psychosocial interventions that have been known for 50 years are not being scaled up, one must confront the fact that there is no commercial value in them. You know, if even a single medicine was available that had even, you know, a modest uh, amount of evidence, as we see for psychosocial interventions, they've been scaled up immediately because, of course, there is a large industry that would support the scale up. It is for those of us who believe in integrative medicine uh, to actually champion and advocate for the scaling up of psychosocial interventions, because if we don't do it, it will never happen. Well, I can't think of a better place to end our discussion. Um, thank you so much for your insight, for all of your work over the many, many years, and um, and for taking time in your busy schedule to, to be an important part of this conference. So thank you, Dr. Patel. And I know that uh, the, our virtual audience is, is uh, enthusiastically clapping in their minds. So best of luck in all your work. Um, and uh, just a note to our um, followers, we're going to take a 10-minute break now. Uh, please log back in on time, and um, you'll have to go to the new to your agenda and pick the next session that Dr. Uh, Nadkarni is going to be emceeing. So once again, thank you very much and, and all my best wishes to you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, I, I hope that was what you were uh, expecting. And uh, uh, thank you so much for the uh, for the opportunity. Pleasure.